views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Why support the League of Women Voters of the City of New York? After 102 years, this all-volunteer organization continues to provide nonpartisan election information. Leading up to and throughout the 2021 citywide elections, even amidst the pandemic, more than 2,000 New Yorkers heard League speakers provide nonpartisan information about ranked choice voting, redistricting and ballot proposals, and thanks to Verizon, saw videos about citywide positions up for election. In November alone, over 1,400 people called the League and received answers to their election and ballot questions. Over 1,000 people tuned in to our virtual monthly series to hear expert speakers talk about crucial topical issues like media bias and can the Board of Elections system be fixed? In partnership with WABC-TV, the League brought citywide debates to a large audience. Why support the League? This grassroots League of over 1,000 volunteers continues to reach out to voters across the five boroughs. In 2021, the League organized a get out the vote effort in low voter turnout districts and along with partner organizations, mailed thousands of postcards to New Yorkers. In partnership with WABC-TV and BronxNet, the League promoted U.S. Constitution Day and handed out over 2,500 pocket copies of the U.S. Constitution in Spanish and English in those same low voter turnout districts along with pertinent ballot information. Trained volunteers conducted over 75 voter registration events in all five boroughs. And trivia night hosted by the League, brought in over 250 young voters to area bars to hear important ballot proposal information. Why support the League? Because the League strongly advocates for issues vital to residents of New York City. The League championed and applauded the success of less is more parole reform and restoring voting rights for people on parole. The League actively supports Turn on the Tap to restore tuition assistance to people in prison. And while they didn't pass in the state, the League takes pride that New York City voted to support the two November ballot measures for voting reform, and the League is still fighting for no excuse absentee balloting and easier voter registration. Why does the League need your support now? The League believes that when people understand who to call and how to get heard, they will feel their own power to make changes. In other words, Civic engagement begins with civic education. The League offers many resources and has literally written the book about New York City government. With your support, the League can expand these adult civic education offerings in more languages and to an even broader audience. This will allow New Yorkers to advocate to improve their own neighborhoods. Nonpartisan, nonprofit, and all volunteer run, the League has been helping New Yorkers for over a century and their work is never done. Help the League of Women Voters continue to fight for a democracy that works for every New Yorker. Please donate, become a member, and add your voice. Vote louder. Good morning. And welcome to the League of Women Voters of the City of New York 2022 Awards Breakfast. Thank you so much for coming. It's so nice to be in a room with all of you in person, right? This is their first in-person event of the year. It is a big deal. I'm Shirlene Ellicott, and I am so delighted to be your host today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, you probably know I've had a really long morning. Um, but I'm happy to be here too. Uh, we've got an exciting and uh, thoughtful program in store for you as we direct our attention to the importance of and access to voting rights in America. The League of Women Voters has been focused on this issue for more than 100
hundred years, and clearly their work is never done. So allow me to introduce you to two co-presidents of the New York City League, Leslie Siegel and Diane Burroughs. Thank you, thank you so much, Charlene. We are delighted to have all of you joining us here today, both in person and virtually. It's fabulous to finally be here together again. I'm sure you all recognize Charlene from her position as co-anchor of WABC TV's Eyewitness News this morning and at noon. We're so lucky she was able to join us today in between her shows. Charlene joined WABC in 2010 and has covered so many huge stories. I'd like to give a shout out to the daily segment you've been hosting all month for women's history. You've highlighted, <laughs> you've highlighted so many women who are making a difference every day in their communities, as are you. Thank you. Leslie and I have served as league co-presidents for two years, entirely during the pandemic. We've only seen each other in person five times. We figured it out. <laughs> like all of you, we were able to pivot for the new online world, expanding our reach to New Yorkers throughout the five boroughs and encouraging our volunteers to get out into the city whenever possible. As an all-volunteer-led organization, we empower over 1,000 volunteers and members. We educate and inform New Yorkers by providing nonpartisan election and civic education information. We provide resources to communities so they can engage with their own elected officials. And since democracy is not a spectator sport, all of us must work together to bring about change. And we need you. This work can't happen without your help and your support. Thank you all so much. Leslie? Thank you so much, Diane. Good morning. Thank you so much, Diane. Good morning, everybody. It is really wonderful to see everybody in person, and not just in person, but everybody dressed very nicely. <laughs> So it's, it's a, a nice change from Zoom conversations. Um, as Diane said, we really can't do this without your help. And so what I'd like to do now is give a special thanks to our sponsors for today's program. I'd like to thank Bloomberg Philanthropies. <laughs> Con Edison. <laughs> Ernst & Young. There's quite a few more, so bear with me. <laughs> Global Strategy. Icor. Nielsen. The Partnership for New York City. Principal Quest. Rebney. Robertson Holland. Verizon, WABC-TV, the YMCA of Greater New York, and last but definitely not least, the organization we are honoring today, the Black Economic Alliance. The thanks are not done yet. I'd also like to give special thanks to two of our advisory board members, Catherine Weil, the president and CEO of the Partnership for New York City, Yay! and Deborah O'Connell, president and CEO, sorry, president networks, Disney Media and Entertainment. I'd also like to thank her amazing team at the Disney Network and WABC TV for everything they've done to get us here today. So please help me, as you already have applauded, thank, you, thank all of our advisory board members as well, as we could not have done this without all of you. 
Please raise your hands for recognition if you're on the advisory board, and we'll give you a round of applause. I'd also like to call out to one of our league board members who assembled her table with donations from her family and friends in honor of her grandparents. Thank you to Sherletta McCaskill and her family. Some are here. And also to those watching remotely from Sherletta's family. And special thanks to all of our league volunteers from the development committee who made this event happen. We are so excited to be honoring the Black Economic Alliance today, and we have David Clooney, the executive director here, who will accept the award. The BEA has worked tirelessly to unite the business community to fight against voter suppression laws, and that really speaks to the core mission of the League, and as we have had done that, the same thing for 200, I'm sorry, losing my way a little bit, pardon me, 103 years. I mean, I wish it was 203, but... We look forward to presenting the award and having a conversation with David later on today. And thank you all for joining us. What a way to close out Women's History Month, right? With this event, this moment, this historic organization. What did you say, 103 years? It's a lot of time. Um, it is incredible the amount of work and impact that can be done with a thousand volunteers as well as caring and thoughtful leaders. Uh, before we introduce our honoree, we'd like to highlight uh, progress on a special and important project that the League is pursuing with the invaluable assistance of graduate students at NYU Wagner School of Public Service that could impact voting reform across New York City. Let's take a look. I've seen lots of wonderful things that have happened, early voting, but you heard a lot of testimony about poll workers. After collecting voter complaints and anecdotal evidence for years and witnessing clear disparities in voter turnout in underserved communities across New York City and testifying to Senate committees, city council, board of elections and other legislative bodies, only to be told we don't have enough evidence. The League of Women Voters of the City of New York sought a way to turn these anecdotes into quantifiable data to try to not only show that the disparity exists, but why. NYU's Robert F. Wagner Graduate School of Public Service students have embraced this as a capstone project. Students will conduct research, review existing studies, collect and analyze data from primary and general elections in New York City. We are going to look at what languages are spoken at poll sites. Are translators readily available? Do the translation services reflect the neighborhood's specific needs? How many poll sites in New York City are not accessible? And how many voters with disabilities in New York are prevented from voting because of a lack of accessible voting options? Are there an adequate number of poll sites in these neighborhoods? How far are voters from their poll sites? And how long are voters' wait times? How are poll workers trained? Are they adequately prepared to deal with problems that can arise at poll sites? League of Women Voters of the City of New York believes the result of this work could be the cornerstone for future discussions and testimony about the disparity of voting access and voter equity in New York City and beyond. Uh, we've invited the students doing this important work to join us here today. Um, so in case you all have any questions for them, they're in this room and I just wanted them to just be recognized so we know where they're sitting. Could you stand or, you know, just make yourself known? Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, as you all are aware, this event is a fundraising event. That's why we're all in this room looking fabulous. Spring-like, many of you. <laughs> 
Um, but it's a fundraising moment, an important one for the League of Women Voters, and we've made it very easy for you to do this. So you, all you're gonna have to do is get out your phones for the next few minutes, and it's gonna be text to give. So it's pretty simple, and you're gonna find the instructions for text to give um, on how to make your donation. You can see it on our screen here, um, but you're also looking at the program um, on the table. Um, and while you're doing that, I would like to introduce yet another dedicated volunteer, Susie Gomes, Vice President of Development, and she's gonna tell you what these funds raised from this event is gonna be going towards. So let's welcome her to the stage and she's gonna break it all down for us. Good morning. It is nice to be here and sort of dialed up a little bit. Um, it isn't quite as warm as we were hoping for, but I love that Charlene is thinking spring in yellow. Um, I want to say thank you to all of you for being here, whether you're here in person or home and joining us remotely. Uh, we are here today because we all believe in and celebrate democracy and know that democracy works best when it involves everyone in the community. Every voice being counted and heard makes our whole system stronger and every neighborhood healthier. And while I could stand here today and list all that we have accomplished with your past support, I would like to paint a picture today of what we can and will accomplish with your support today. So get out your phones, like we said. I know you silenced them earlier. Hopefully you didn't turn them off. Um, so if you could, turn them back on. Um, and I will share, as you know, that any and all of your donations, no matter how large or small, means so much to the League. So if you could, there's not only on the screen you'll find the information, but in a little card inside your um, information on, on the, about the uh, breakfast this morning, you'll, you'll find the information as well. You can text your name and your pledge amount to 551, I'm sorry, 263, 0033 while I'm speaking. Didn't I say that by five? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, see, and I'm supposed to be the numbers person. So my apologies on that. Just follow along on the screen. Don't listen to me. <laughs> Our wonderful interns will be receiving the text and they will be sending you a link to make your donation. A lot of our outreach efforts at the League are focused on low voter turnout districts around the city. Why is that? Because we know that a neighborhood that is civically engaged brings attention to their needs. We know that a neighborhood that votes gets more services and resources. And we know that a neighborhood that votes is a healthier neighborhood. Our work on the ground in these low voter turnout districts focuses on providing nonpartisan voter registration and election information, but we also provide the tools to know how to knock on the doors of City Hall, how to contact a community board or city council rep, and how to be a citizen advocate for themselves and their community. I see that some of you have had your pledges come in already. Thank you, and please keep them coming. We at the League love what we do with that information that we provide to these communities, but we at the League also see a much bigger need across the city. Did you know that approximately 90% of eligible adults are registered to vote in New York City, that's a great number. 90% are registered. But did you also know that in this past municipal election year, 2021, 
only 21% of those eligible did vote, that is not a great number. And that is down from 23% in 2013. That is not a great democracy. The League wants to close that gap between those registered to vote and those that do vote. And to do that, we know we need to share the wealth of what that vote can do to empower each voter to support their neighborhoods and to know what their government is going to do and meant to do for them. This will be our adult civics learning initiative for all adults, but especially for the young adults in the city who didn't get civic education in high school when it was significantly cut from the curriculum over a year, a decade ago. But this will all take funding. We, yes, we are all volunteers, but building and distributing the program is going to cost money. So if you could donate $5,000 today, what will that do? We could develop and translate more of our resources, like our presentations and handouts, into more languages to reach people. As you may know, there are more than 600 active languages spoken in New York City today. We could develop and produce more videos to be used in our adult civics education initiative to educate more New Yorkers on what, how, and who in government impacts their lives. We could produce and print the next edition of What Makes New York City Run. That's the book on your table right there. And you, that's the book that was written by one of our own league members and is the basis for our own civics education and used by actually many CUNY classes as well. If you could donate $2,500 today, we could purchase more U.S. Constitution booklets in multiple languages to hand out in more districts. Last year, as part of our Constitution Day voter activation, we handed out almost 3,000 Constitution booklets in two languages, and we had that many conversations in six voter uh, low turnout districts, excuse me. And they were amazing conversations. Thank you to ABC and BronxNet for helping support that day. And they were overwhelming, these conversations. They, 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 just, they were just overwhelming. We would provide posters to hang, signs to carry, and handouts printed in multiple languages to bring attention and focus to the cause wherever we were. If you could give at the $2,500 level, you could be sending us to the League into more neighborhoods to make a difference. So please text your pledge to help us make that difference. And for $1,000, we could host more Voter Fest trivia nights and attract even more young voters. Last year, we reached almost 300 young voters. This is the age that votes at the lowest rate. And if they don't vote now, will they ever? We know that voting at an early age leads to a lifetime habit of voting. But did you also know that when children in the household vote, their parents are also more likely to vote? And we could significantly amplify our social media presence. This is a huge part of our outreach, especially for young voters in the future. $1,000 makes a big difference. Any amount makes a big difference because it all adds up. So please text whatever you can to the number on the screen. I'm not going to try to say it again. <laughs> you can continue to text throughout the morning, and I thank you. Now please take a peek under your bread plate to see who has a copy of a little sticker. If you have the sticker, you have won your table's copy of the book on your table of What Makes New York City Run. If you have not won, Well, this
this is quite exciting. If you have not won, but you are interested in a copy, please stop by the front table on your way out today and sign up. Thank you and have a wonderful rest of the morning. That was a wonderful show of support. Thank you so much for all that you've contributed. Um, you can continue to do so. Uh, I thank you on behalf of the League and personally thank you um, for helping this organization do its work. I come from immigrant parents who came here back in 1981. We lived in Queens and um, you know, I have definitely witnessed some of those disparities that the League is working so hard to fight against and I have been a recipient, I'm sure. Um, so thank you again. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the Black Economic Alliance. Black Americans have never been full participants in the American economy. Public and private sector policies have precluded black people and families from thriving throughout our nation's entire history. This systemic inequality has resulted in exclusion from the broader economy while limiting our country's economic potential in the process. That is why the Black Economic Alliance was created. Founded in 2018, the Black Economic Alliance is a nonpartisan group of black executives and business leaders who are leading the charge to improve economic mobility for black Americans. The BEA is the nation's only coalition of business leaders and advocates committed to driving black wealth, building at scale, focusing on improving the quality of work, wages, and wealth for black Americans. The disproportionate impact of COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic, brought to light many of the systemic health, economic, and infrastructure-related inequities black communities face. BEA helps steer the national discussion to ensure that these failures result in meaningful systemic change. Through its foundation, BEA introduced the Center for Black Entrepreneurship, partnering with Spelman College and Morehouse College. BEA developed the first ever academic center of its kind to produce, train, and support the next generation of black entrepreneurial talent. The foundation also collaborated with Wells Fargo to launch the BEA Entrepreneurs Fund, a $50 million venture capital fund to provide seed, startup, and early stage capital to black-owned businesses and aspiring founders. Partnering with the Center for Political and Economic Studies at the end of last year, BEA co-led the charge to encourage the Biden administration to appoint qualified black candidates to key economic leadership roles. Since its inception, BEA has focused on the potential power of black voters. In the lead up to the 2020 general election, BEA seized a meaningful opportunity to leverage its platform and lead conversations around economic issues pertaining to black voters and the importance of black civic participation. Along with BET, the National Urban League and other partners, the Black Economic Alliance helped launch the first ever National Black Voter Day in September 2020 to inspire black voters to make a plan and vote early. Following the historic turnout and impact of black voters in the 2020 election, laws were introduced in almost every state to restrict access to the ballot. BEA responded immediately and impactfully. BEA invoked its platform and moral authority to rally the business community to oppose restrictive voting laws and advocate for the expansion of voting rights. It ran a full page ad in the New York Times on March 31st, 2021, signed by 72 black executives, and then organized a two-page ad signed by over 500 business leaders opposing voter discrimination. Despite all of these achievements, there is still more work to be done. 
and the Black Economic Alliance is ready and willing to answer the call. They are just getting started. Please join me in welcoming David Clooney to the stage. David Clooney is the executive director of the Black Economic Alliance, and he is going to accept the award on behalf of the Black Economic Alliance for this amazing work. Thank you. Diane. Out of the way. Oh, that is cool. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you, Charlene. David, on behalf of the League of Women Voters of the City of New York, we present the Black Economic Alliance with our Distinguished Service Award. With this award, we recognize your work in appealing to corporate America to publicly oppose any discriminatory voting legislation and any and all measures designed to limit the ability to vote. We are proud to applaud your organization's efforts and work. We stand with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Leslie. This is beautiful. I'm fragile. I'm going to try to not break it. Would you like me to set up? I will ask you to hold it for a quick second. And the good news is I'm not going to speak long. So um, David Clooney. On behalf of the Black Economic Alliance, thank you to the League of Women Voters of the City of New York for organizing this wonderful event, for honoring the Black Economic Alliance for our work. Thank you for 103 years of your work. Um, it is not an accident. Let's clap for that, please. <laughs> um, I'm not going to speak long because you will hear from, uh, from us as I speak with our good friend Janine Liburd. Um, but it is not an accident that I'm wearing purple, uh, a suffragist <laughs> color, this morning in honor of, of the work that you all have done. Um, so it's really an honor to be recognized by you for the work that we've done. And uh, we all, as you'll hear more about in our conversation, have a part to play in protecting our democracy. So thank you for all the work you've done. And it is an honor for the Black Economic Alliance to step into this space as well. So thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, I got it. All right. <laughs> Congratulations, David. A well, well-deserved recognition for all the great work you guys are doing. Um, now, this is a really exciting part of the program. We're gonna have a conversation between David and Janine Liebert. Liebert. Um, so while David takes his seat, um, he's gonna be taking his seat on the stage. Come on back, come on back. <laughs> um, we're gonna tell you a little more about David. Uh, uh, this, this is always fun. Should I stand up here? I'm gonna stand painful. up here. Let me, let me stand up here. Uh, David Clooney has served as executive director since March 2020, and under his leadership, BEA has worked to close the opportunity gaps for black Americans in work, wages, and wealth throughout, uh, through political action, uh, voter activation, and engagement with business leaders. Uh, before joining BEA, David Clooney was a managing director at J.P. Morgan Chase in the Corporate Responsibility Department. Uh, he has served as an appointee of President Barack Obama at the Treasury Department and a member of Secretary Jacob J. Liu's senior staff. From 2010 to 2012, Mr. Clooney served as Deputy Associate Counsel at the White House where he vetted incoming presidential appointees and served as a mentor in the White House Mentors Program, a predecessor to the My Brother's Keeper initiative. David's fight for voting rights uh, started years ago as a litigation associate at the Paul Weiss Law Firm, uh, providing pro bono services involving voting rights as well as other civil rights issues. He partnered with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and the Brennan Center for Justice to oppose restrictive voter ID laws in Georgia and Indiana. David sits on the board of the National Urban League and on the U.S. Small Business Administration's Council on Underserved. So he's been busy. <laughs> um, underserved communities, by the way. His incredibly hectic schedule <laughs> has him all over the country, but he calls Harlem his home. Indeed. 
We are delighted to have you here, and let's welcome our other part of this conversation, uh, Janine Lybird. Come on down to the stage, Janine. <laughs> Janine Lybird has agreed to join David in today's conversation about voting rights in America. Janine is the Chief Social Impact and Communications Officer for BET, the Black Entertainment Television Network, that has been providing African-American-centric programming to audiences for more than 40 years. In her role, Janine leads and elevates social change initiatives that empower the BET audience to have an impact on the critical issues facing the black community today. In 2020, she partnered with United Way Worldwide to raise over $19 million in emergency relief for COVID. She created the company's signature civic engagement campaign, Reclaim Your Vote, and was instrumental in creating the National Black Voter Day along with BEA and the National Urban League. Janine has received numerous awards for her work and serves on at least six boards of civic and cultural organizations. While her work is national in scope, her New York ties run deep. Janine was born and bred in Brooklyn. Hey. Okay. Uh, she earned her master's from the New School University for social research and she worked in the David Dinkins administration. She still calls New York her home. We are thrilled that Janine could join us today. I will now hand the program over to you, Janine, and we'll be back up uh, for Q&A. Thank you. Um, thank you to the League of Women Voters um, and the BEA for um, inviting me to be here. This is so exciting. Let's just get right into it. There's so many questions I have for David, so um, I'm just going to get into it. Um, part of what we just, all of the incredible of accomplishments of BEA, it's just really amazing to see and having a side seat to watching it all come together. This is really incredible to be here today. So again, congratulations. Thank you. Um, so one of the things we saw up there was the New York Times ad. Tomorrow will be a year from that moment where there was the response to what was happening in Georgia. Can you tell us a little bit about what that was about, how that came, and then in that context, just share a little bit more about the mission of the BEA? Absolutely. So let me start by saying, this microphone can hear what I'm thinking. Um, <laughs> <this> is, <laughs> um, thank you again to the League of Women Voters of the City of New York. Um, for pulling us together, I, you know, after not leaving the house for two years, I'm easily impressed, but a full-on meal and we're all dressed up and uh, everybody's here safely. This is a phenomenal undertaking, so really appreciate you putting this together, uh, but for this moment. And uh, as you talked about, the ad of a year ago was, was a really special moment for um, black executives who, before BEA was formed in 2018, there really had not been um, a coalition of black CEOs. And, and uh, Vernon Jordan, who you saw in one of the pictures there, uh, who was kind of part of the blessing of, of BEA when it, one of the original meetings when it came together, that's what the picture was from, said there had not been a critical mass of black executives in corporate America uh, previously. And now that we have more of a critical mass, we have a responsibility to use the resources and platforms um, of some of the most plugged in, resourceful uh, black folks across industries collectively to improve conditions for our community. And, and the Black Economic Alliance came together to do that uh, with a, a laser focus on um, economic mobility, but um, a, a part and parcel of that has been participation in a functioning democracy. Um, and so the ad from a year ago was really a recognition by black CEOs that was largely driven by um, a phone call from Sherilyn Eiffel, the then director counsel and president of the uh, NAACP Legal Defense Fund, um, who essentially said, are you all paying attention to these laws that are passing in, in different states, um, really almost every state, uh, that were essentially a reaction to the 2020 election where you had higher black voter participation and higher voter participation than we had ever had in American history. And, and pulling that off in a year where we were grappling with you know, a, a global pandemic and figuring out how to do it safely should have been something we were celebrating, but in, instead you had this reaction of um, Legislature, state legislatures passing laws to restrict access to the ballot. So um, over a series of calls over a weekend, uh, a number of folks, including uh, our very own Fred Terrell, who is here in the audience, um, who's an advisory board member of the Black Economic Alliance, and Charles Phillips, and Ken Chenault, and Ken Frazier, and others, 
pulled together a group of folks and said, we have to be heard, um, and decided to fund and, and be, uh, the Black Economic Alliance helped fund in place in the New York Times uh, a, full a full page ad, which was a letter to corporate America, essentially saying, we've seen this playbook before, everybody needs to pay attention to this, we all have a part to play in either you know, um, being a part of the solution or the problem, um, and we need corporate America to get off the sidelines um, and be part of the solution and, and essentially stand up for voting rights. And that set in, in motion uh, a chain of events that uh, I've never seen before. I've been doing voting rights work for a very long time throughout my career, and um, it really called, I think, shined a different light uh, on this work than we've ever seen, and, and that resulted in, about two weeks later, an ad that was placed in the uh, USA Today, New York Times, Washington Post, and Wall Street Journal. That was a two-page ad with over 500 uh, executives signed on saying, we stand for democracy, and, and that led to a, a series of you know, meetings and uh, 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 sessions with you know, senators and, and others, essentially pushing to take the politics out of uh, the, the discussion of voting rights and make it something that is part and parcel of a functioning democracy. So that's an example of BEA's work, but, but what BEA is about uh, is similar to that New York Times ad, using the platforms of you know, well-resourced, um, plugged in, black executives to call attention to issues that um, essentially will help accelerate participation in a functioning democracy, and for us, a laser focus on economic mobility for black Americans through the work we do um, from our foundation, through advocacy, and through political action as well. Well, it was just, um, an in clearly I needed this, um, <laughs> an incredible um, movement, and I remember waking up and watching Ken Chenal on CBS Mornings, which I hope you're all watching CBS Mornings, Division of Paramount <laughs> Global, thank you. Shameless uh, plug. Shameless plug. <laughs> um, and just being so impressed with, with that moment. So before we go back into all of those things, because there's a lot to unpack, tell us a little bit about David Clooney. We, we heard, didn't hear enough. We heard, we heard the highlights. We heard the highlights. But tell us um, where you grew up. I'd love to know. I always love to know how you got even excited about this work because there's always yeah. something about the journey that 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 lights that. Well, fire. let me first say it is it is really such an honor and a privilege for me to even represent the Black Economic Alliance. This group speaks to so many pieces of my career, but things I have been passionate about throughout my career and. Um, I, I really get the privilege and opportunity to lead work with a you know, phenomenal group of people, a few of whom are in the room, the president of our foundation, Samantha Tweedy, um, a new member of our team, Miranda Tyson, on the donor and member engagement team, um, and a number of our, uh, our colleagues, our communications colleagues from Global Strategy Group here. But uh, it, it, for me, is the, the next step. And throughout my career, I've been, so I grew up here in New York, uh, Westchester originally, and then the Bronx the opposite order that a lot of people do that in. Um, <laughs> my uh, family is of Jamaican descent, but parents grew up in Harlem. Uh, and, and I, um, after returning to New York, you know, I went to SUNY Albany for undergrad. I went to uh, Howard University School of Law. And at Howard, really, I, was, I learned that um, you know, Charles Hamilton Houston, who was the dean of Howard Law when um, Thurgood Marshall was a student there, and he was really the architect of the Brown versus Board of Education series of cases had a saying that a lawyer is either a social engineer or a parasite on society. And that was to say, <laughs> I know, it's, it's kind of black and white, right? I mean, um, that's pretty straightforward. <laughs> but that was to say, you know, those of us who learn the Constitution and, and learn the laws of the United States have a responsibility to use that knowledge to improve conditions for our communities. And that is exactly what the Black Economic Alliance is about. And throughout my career, I had been doing a lot of this work really as an extracurricular activity. You know, when I was at Paul Weiss, I was doing all this pro bono work that I was so engaged in around voting rights, around um, you know, uh, uh, police community relations, um, around prisoners' rights, et cetera. And then uh, in the administration, you know, I was finding these opportunities to work on economic inclusion and economic mobility, particularly at the Treasury Department. And when I went to J.P. Morgan Chase, I really, I realized, you know, my, my side hustles were becoming like <laughs> more than my day job. You know, leading the. I heard that's called a Howard hustle. That's what I heard. That's exactly right. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we, I, 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 throughout my time at J.P. Morgan in particular, you know, was one of few black managing directors in the corporate responsibility group, one of only two, the only one in the United States. So that kind of de facto made me a you know, <laughs> DEI representative as well. Um, and so many things we did were about racial equity inside the organization, how we were interacting with communities, particularly around economic empowerment. And, and I just hit a point in my career where I said, let me stop doing this as a side hustle. This is what I want to do day to day. And, and the opportunity to join the Black Economic Alliance presented itself. Uh, and, and I had been you know, thinking about what I want to be when I grow up you know, at age 39, <laughs> and um, 
you know, this, this opportunity just could not have been more in line with who I am as a person, what I've wanted to do, and the impact that I want to have. And I, you know, one of my mentors made me write out uh, on a piece of paper in the abstract, you know, uh, agnostic of any job, what I wanted to do. And, and it was as if I had written the job description to be the executive director of the Black Economic Alliance. So a real pleasure to have this opportunity. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I remember meeting with you when you had just started your job over Zoom, and it was like day four. It was like, <laughs> hi. Uh, <laughs> so I was a mess, is what you're saying. <laughs> no, 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 you were very clear. I was, I was a mess. But, well, that's a whole other COVID story for another day. But in any, in any case, so clearly, and I think particularly now, post-George Floyd, people are much more focused on um, the economic well-being of the black community and what needs to happen. Um, I love to hear, but I love how you all have always been focused on voting rights as a part of work, wages, and wealth. Can That's you right. little, talk a little bit more about why that connection has been so clear and so important in the direction of your work? Absolutely. So much of the work that the Black Economic Alliance does focused on economic mobility is about full participation. We, we, we talked about, Charlene talked earlier about, you know, black folks have never been full participants in the American experience, in American democracy, and certainly not in the American economy. Um, and the work that I got to do uh, at, at Treasury, at J.P. Morgan Chase, and, and that so many of the executives in our organization have done throughout their careers, we have all seen the obstacles uh, to folks having the opportunities that, that some of the members of the Black Economic Alliance have had. And, um, and, and so we have been so focused on how we can remove those obstacles, create pathways for full participation, and part and parcel of that is the ability to be a full participant in a functioning democracy and be able to put people in place who will represent your interests um, in Congress, in, in local uh, government, uh, at all levels. So our, our ability to create um, f better and improved participation in a functioning democracy drives our ability um, to be able to create full participation in a functioning economy. He just makes that all sound so good, doesn't he? <laughs> like just really. OK. Um, so I, I want to dig into the business side of it. I mean, it is very unique um, in this con construct of the BEA to have the most senior, most African-American business leaders who run major, major businesses, major business units come together in this way. Um, it's never been done before. It is a, clearly a unique and very really special opportunity. Um, can you just talk a little bit about the responsibility of the business community? I think in the past, it's kind of like voting was kind of other people's jobs. It's mm -hmm. the, for the government and public interest to worry about. Can you just talk a little bit about, and also I'd love to get into like how did you even get all those people together? A little bit about the process. I know some of it obviously happened before you started, but. Yeah, yeah so it's really you know about um, this evolution of the role that the business community plays in the communities they serve. Um, and, and I got a taste of that, particularly working in corporate responsibility um, at the largest bank in America. Um, but it is about, you know, there is an impact organizations have, particularly business organizations have on their communities, for better or for worse. And, and companies are spending a lot of resources trying to get to a place where they can figure out how to use their resources to be a positive impact on the communities they serve. And they're thinking a lot more about environmental, social, and governance, um, ESG these days. And, and I think um, their ability to be thoughtful about how they are interacting with communities uh, and, and use their resources in a deliberate and strategic way to improve conditions uh, is, is something that we feel like is, is part of our responsibility to help them do because there's no playbook for this. Um, but I think especially coming out of the uh, post-George Floyd racial equity commitments, um, rhetorical and financial that so many organizations have made, you know, they, the folks say things like we took the blinders off and, and we now you know, see in a different way the experience that our you know, black employees, that our black clients and stakeholders, you know, the different experience they've been having in America than uh, their, their white counterparts in particular, and uh, that they want to be part of the solution, no longer the problem. And we you know, are looking at things like voting rights as an opportunity to be part of that solution and to take the blinders off. And instead of saying, well, this isn't really our issue, we're not a voting rights organization, say, we have resources to make available to make voting easier for people, whether it is you know, giving time off, whether it is distributing you know, information. Um, but, but one of the other reasons we, we really tried to make this, get the business community involved in voting rights is um, because there has been a perception that voting rights has become partisan. 
Um, it never has been in the past. Uh, there's been legislation over years that's been passed and reauthorized, like the Voting Rights Act that has been done on a bipartisan basis, that has been signed, you know, re-signed into law by um, Republican and Democratic uh, presidents alike, and um, you know, in, in some cases passed nearly unanimously by Congress. Um, but we've gotten to a place where it's become perceived as partisan, and that's um, what we were trying to do by getting the, one of the things we were trying to do by getting the business community involved was take the partisanship out of the conversation and make it about a you know, fundamental issue of a functioning democracy and civic engagement. So similar to um, you know, people serving on juries uh, and, and jury duty being something that we encourage people to do and have to do, we want people to be speaking about voting the same way. And, and to, you know, it, we, it's almost passe to talk about voting at work. And it's like, you know, I had to go vote today and you don't want to tell anybody. <laughs> um, but we're not talking about who you're voting for. We're not encouraging people to drive folks to a particular party or candidate or any of that. It is about making it, um, making it part and parcel of your civic duty to be engaged in voting and to do more than just signing, you know, showing up and casting your ballot, to be, but to be part of a system that makes it easier for everyone to vote. I, I love um, that point that you're making there because I think that's something I, we wouldn't have even thought about really that voting rights is a partisan, that has become a partisan issue. Like that is just like, does it, that just makes your stomach kind of just have a feeling about that because it makes no sense. Um, you know, we're coming to a midterm election, which also gives me that same feeling in my stomach. Um, I'm curious, as you're thinking about kind of the things that you'll be doing going forward, how can we begin to continue to change that message? Because I think that's one of the things, you know, looking around this room and knowing um, so many of the faces, I feel like that is, you know, yes, we have to get people out to vote, but we also have to change this notion. What are some of the things that the BEA will do and that we can do alongside with you? So the, there are one of the good things to come out of the last year and change is, I think, coalitions of like-minded organizations who that are working, growing in the same direction, working toward, um, bringing uh, you know, people of good faith together, organizations, individuals, and otherwise, around trying to make it easier for everyone to vote. And I think messaging is a huge part of that. Um, we're, we're in a space, and, and you know this better than anyone, being in the industry you're in, being in the role you're in, um, where it is hard for people to get access to good information and, and to, you know, I think, um, have faith in the integrity of that information. And that's a huge, I think the, the business community has such a huge platform and role to play there. Just you know, talking about information dis dissemination um, and helping people get access to good information. And, you know, when, we, when I was at J.P. Morgan, we were doing things like putting um, uh, in, on local uh, bank branches when people go to the ATM, putting uh, voting deadlines or, you know, deadlines to register to vote or deadlines for, um, you know, you to get your ballot in, whatever it is. Using your platforms to get good information out to folks in a way that they understand what their options are, what their responsibilities are, um, and, and taking the, the, part, the perceived partisanship um, out of talking about voting rights, uh, but also just using your platform to, to help create more avenues for more people to get involved. So um, there's a lot that folks can do, uh, particularly the business community, give people time off to vote, not only on election day, but even earlier. Um, the, you know, we, we're in a place where so many states have passed laws that allow people to vote early you know, by mail or in person. We want to encourage folks to volunteer um, to you know, go to your polling places and, and help them you know, administer elections, um, you know, use the channels that businesses have to get good information out to folks, partner with trusted organizations, local organizations that will help um, get people engaged in this process. So there are a multitude of things that um, the business community can do and that organizations like BEA uh, will continue to push folks to do. And I, and I do, and we mentioned it before as a part of the, the montage about BEA, but you know, BET, uh, played such a leadership role in 2020 when we were figuring, we're trying to figure out how can we get people out when people were, were legitimately scared, you know, just talking about the pandemic um, of leaving their homes or even engaging in the voting process because they're like, I'm, I'm, you know, there's no vaccine. I'm trying to be safe and I'm not going to go to a polling place and be around a bunch of people when you haven't been interacting with people any other way and creating uh, National Black Voter Day for the first time in 2020 and giving people a five-step plan you know, or, or kind of process to follow to make a plan, get all the information they need, make sure you kind of have a backup plan. That's exactly the kind of thing we can be encouraging other folks to do. Well, thank you so much and thank you for being an early partner of uh, Reclaim Your Vote and National Black Voter Day, which is the third Friday of us every September as our 
CBC has made it so, so noted and so done. For some, how we're almost done. I'm like, I don't know which question to ask. <laughs> I like, is my last, my, my, like, my go home question. I wanted to ask too many things. Um, so just as we, you know, wrap up, you've given so many kind of gems and, and points about how we can move forward. Um, what are maybe the biggest challenge and biggest opportunity you see for BEA and for all of us? Um, just kind of give us some go forward uh, good news. So on the challenge side, I'll start with the bad news and go to the good yeah, news. But on, the, on the challenge side, democracies are fragile. We're seeing that more in the last few years than we've ever seen, and that's both at home and abroad. Um, and I think about an example of um, right after uh, the 15th Amendment was passed, right after you know, the abolition of slavery and 15th Amendment was passed, giving black men the ability to vote. <clears throat> in the first few years, you had an influx of registration and participation and um, uh, a, a black senator, I'm sorry, a black Congress member was, was elected. Um, a number of black Congress members were elected in the South and two black senators were elected. And then the reaction to that, and I think about it very similar to the reaction to 2020, the reaction to this you know, phenomenal increase in participation was um, voter suppression laws and Jim Crow laws. And you, you, in Mississippi, for example, went from a situation when you had 90%, 90% voter participation to 6% voter participation among black men in the space of two years. And I think of that as an example of what's possible if we're not vigilant and, and we're not, we don't take the moment seriously. And this is not just about black voters, this is about all voters and our ability to you know, have um, free and fair elections that um, represent the will of the people um, and, and that are respected at home and abroad as, you know, um, um, as elections that people can respect. On the hopeful side, um, I think folks are starting to understand the scope of the problem and uh, as much as there is hesitance to you know, get involved in what is perceived to be a, a, a partisan political issue, I think there is an appreciation that everyone has a role to play. Um, so I think organizations and individuals are being more thoughtful about how they can get in the game, how they can get off the sidelines, and, and BEA, BET, uh, the League of Women Voters, uh, and, and others, so many others, will be part of the you know, solution of helping folks use their resources to be part of the solution and, and get involved. So I, I really look forward to reaching more people where they are, using the you know, 2022 and 2024 elections as opportunities to get more people uh, of all ages and, and all you know, political stripes involved in the process of voting. And I do think um, if when we do that, we will all see the benefit, the, the net benefit um, for our democracy. Well, thank you so, so much. I do want to take one moment of privilege um, just to say thank you to the BEA for all of the work and support you've done um, with BET as well. I think leadership is one of the most important things because if you don't have someone stepping out there and taking that first step, there won't be anyone else to follow you. And thank you for mentioning that almost 20 million we raised for COVID, but so much of that was due to the work, and I have to shout out our wonderful board member Fred over there, hi, and Samantha <laughs> um, from BEA, who were really our biggest um, vocal champions uh, when we were raising all of that money in partnership with United Way. So I just wanted to say thank you for the leadership always in every area, um, because it, you do it with your work, you do it with your money too, and that's really, really important. So thank you, thank you to the League of Women Voters for having us, and I'm gonna pass it back to Shirley. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Janine. And let's see. You can probably hear through my mic from over here. I'm, <laughs> I'm sure I'm serious. <laughs> but thank you. Said, thank you, thank you Janine and David. Janine, thank you for hosting that conversation. It was exactly what we needed to hear. It was refreshing. It was powerful. And thank you. Yes, yes, so everybody could see me virtually. You seen. You don't need to see me. You guys have seen enough of me. But David, thank you also. Um, the power in his voice, the strength in your voice, and the fact that your parents are West Indian too. Big ups! <laughs> um, no, but thank you. Uh, thank you for the work that BEA is doing. You guys are the change makers, and you guys are really going to elicit the change that this country so desperately needs. Um, I have something good to announce. Uh, the league raised today over 10,000 in the room. $10,000. So thank you all for that. Thank you, thank you for coming.
to the league's 2022 breakfast. I hope you guys enjoyed yourselves. We really appreciate it. And uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you.